Mirzla, we want to chat to you about the whole issue of forgiveness. And for you, it's there was a number of issues for you as an individual and as your family. And I want to explore a couple of those, just your own experience of having to forgive. It started with your dad. Yeah, most, most, in most families, there is a kind of forgiveness uh, stuff. Uh, I have been blessed with the kind of family experience when there's a lot of forgiveness stuff uh, going on. Um, and in many ways, uh, foundational for our family was my dad's experience of uh, a person com who was, as he saw it, a completely innocent 18-year-old um, kid who was then uh, shoved into uh, a concentration camp and then a death march where out of about 1,000 people who started, uh, 300 uh, were still alive about a month and a half or two months afterwards. And um, it's in this experience where my dad both felt this incredible rage against the world and against God that at the same time, it's too long story to, um, to retell, but he experienced almost like a breakthrough of the love of God in his life. And he discovered actually in the pit of hell uh, that God is um, love and that God uh, loves him and loves the world. And that was for him a foundational really experience. Uh, in many ways, I feel that what happened is that God delivered him from the hell of his own hatred and his own rebellion and set him uh, on in a free space where he could not simply react to circumstances, but in some ways be the Lord of the circumstances. And you saw him do that in your life as you were growing up? Uh, I saw that uh, entirely shaping his, uh, his life, um, meaning that he himself was able then to have a, a positive, non-reactive relationship to variety of situations in which he himself was uh, uh, under pressure. He was a minister uh, of a Pentecostal church in uh, um, former Yugoslavia under communist uh, regime, pressures of, from every side. And yet he and my mother as well, they have kind of preserved the beauty of their own uh, soul just because they wouldn't let themselves be shaped by the pressures that came from the from the outside. I think that's a fundamental stance that kind of shapes also the attitude of forgiveness and almost like a condition of possibility of there being something like uh, forgiveness. I think that's the most fundamental uh, event in our family lives. And, and it it was more than just the fact that there was a cultural issue, wasn't it? Because you lost a brother in, a, in, in terrible circumstance and their response was instructive. It was tied also to the cultural issue because the, the guy who uh, actually um, was instrumental in my uh, five-year-old brother um, being killed was a member of Yugoslavian um, army. Right, so there were kind of resonances of the same army which was persecuting my father and now um, um, basically through negligence, but nonetheless had my younger brother uh, killed. It's interesting because my mother and father, both independently of each other, uh, when they've heard the news, uh, decided that they will forgive. And almost like the, an immediate reaction. Um, the Word of God says that we have been forgiven by God in Christ and therefore we ought to forgive. And it was just well, as simple as that for them. Now, it was as simple as that for them, I think, to decide. But my mother, in the same breath, when she tells that, she says, this was the most difficult of all acts that I had to do because everything in your soul, in your heart screams for revenge, streams for, it's got to pay for what he has done. Uh, and then there's a struggle between the desire for revenge or at least some form of justice and um, the call to, to forgiveness. And it's in that struggle between the two 
that really the fruit of actual forgiveness uh, occurs. It's a and, tough thing, forgiveness. And then even in your own life later on, with again, with this, as it were, the same army, when you became a young man and you were you were uh, dealt with in s difficult circumstances as well. Yeah, I was, uh, I was at that time um, already on my way to become professor of uh, theology. I was doing my doctoral uh, work and uh, had those conscripted into uh, military service of the Yugoslavian, uh, then Yugoslavian army. And the whole unit was organized uh, around spying on me. All the conversations that I had were recorded and then after uh, a few months, then interrogations uh, started. They weren't uh, uh, anything like um, uh, kind of physically threatening uh, or even experience of uh, physical, physical uh, abuse was not part of those, but nonetheless immense uh, psychological uh, pressure there. And um, there I had to learn again, uh, in a sense, and struggle again with what happens uh, when you're experiencing a uh, violation, um, when you are wronged, how do you respond uh, as a victim? How do you respond in terms of in the situation itself? Uh, but then how do you respond after the situation, so to speak, uh, when the situation continues uh, in your memory? And so uh, I believe that Forgiveness is also fundamentally issue of what we do with our memories, how we deal with our mm. memories of wrongdoing suffered. Indeed, also how we do uh, deal with memories of wrongs that we have perpetrated. Uh, both of those things are implicated. Uh, one in how do I uh, forgive and the other, how might I repent or would I repress this? Would I pretend as if not uh, and therefore uh, seek kind of a false consolation of suppression rather than true consolation of repentance and forgiveness. Now, for, for you and for your parents, there was a foundation of the teaching of Jesus. So what does Jesus teach about forgiveness? I think in some ways you can say that one of the uh, most important quote-unquote contributions, if you want uh, to put it this way, or the signature features of Jesus uh, ministry was that he proclaimed unconditional love of God, which I think forked in two, uh, in two, went in two directions, almost like a parallel, uh, parallel and interrelated tracks. And one was attention to the suffering of people, to the, the concrete needs uh, that they had. But at the same time, the other was attention to uh, their own reaction to the situation in which they find themselves and therefore the need, their own need uh, for forgiveness. It's no accident that Jesus comes proclaiming the kingdom of God and repentance. There's a good news and there is repentance, but between the good news and repentance is the offer of forgiveness. A kind of unconditional love, which is love for the ungodly not just the love for the needy, this love for the ungodly, I think is at the center of Jesus' proclamation. And therefore, rightly, I think it is at the center of the Christian faith. It's good to explore both those areas because it's the, there's a sense of we're being called to forgive, but there's also the sense that, as you say, that Jesus is bringing unconditional forgiveness to all people through what he's done. In that first area, what, what does Jesus say about needing to forgive? And is it different from other teachings of his time? Well, I think what Jesus, uh, basically the two things are quite, uh, qu quite closely related. The unconditionali unconditionality of God's forgiveness uh, of humans that uh, comes to us in Jesus Christ, which is also, by the way, tied to the universality. It's not only to some, those who are close by, or those who belong to my in-group, uh, but to all people, that is to say, then unconditional love, which is also universal love, that's the foundation also then of the, of the Christian, uh, Christian life, right? So uh, a kind of unconditional love in the situation where somebody has wronged me uh, is already one step toward uh, forgiving the one who has wronged me and forgiving, in fact, as a, as a first act, not necessarily as a response to the uh, request for repentance. And I think that's central for Jesus' uh, teaching. Just like in Jesus, God forgave without 
people first asking for repentance, just like Jesus on the cross uh, forgave without uh, people asking for repentance. So also, I think there is a place in Christian faith which says, you forgive irrespective of what the other does. If the other repents, great. Uh, that's what the other person ought to do. That's their responsibility. But your responsibility, my responsibility is to forgive irrespective of what the other person does. By the way, um, this is exactly what my father experienced, right? Uh, when he was in his concentration, and that was his discovery, his concentration camp, right? I cannot lead my life in reaction to what somebody else does. I lead it sovereignly in response to God's call, in response to God's unconditional love. And you said in that, there's, a, there's actually freedom in that, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because if you have a reactive stance, to where the circumstances, you are always uh, a slave of the circumstances. You're always tied by this thick cord of what you think needs to be then done to somebody who has done something to you. You are bound in a, in a struggle. It's almost like you're in a wrestling match and you are, uh, you, you're in it right now. And there's only, only option is to either completely disengage or simply to uh, overcome or be o o overcome. But I, I think it's a very different situation if you find yourself being able, able sovereignly to dictate what you do. And I think that's what the call to forgiveness, that's what unconditionality of love allows you to do. And that's tremendous power, not just, not just the freedom, there's tremendous power in that. And that's why I think that many people also desire forgiveness because they sense intuitively that it gives them this power. Is, is, is it just Jesus' example of offering unconditional forgiveness or is there specific teaching that is unique to Jesus in, the, in what he says or what he taught? Um, well, obviously he taught about uh, forgiveness and uh, forgiveness uh, as a kind of universal stance is, I think, specific, uh, specific to, to Jesus. I am less interested, frankly, in what is specific to Jesus. I'm interested in what is central to Jesus. And I think that the fundamental influence of Jesus, it doesn't happen primarily through what is how marginally or radically he's different than others. It, it happens through what is central and organizes everything, right? Now, once you start thinking in those terms, then you realize, oh, Jesus doesn't need to be absolutely unique. Jesus can pick up, and indeed you would expect Jesus to pick up all sorts of stuff that has been coming along the way. After all, God is the creator, God is the preserver, and indeed Jesus Christ, according to Christian teaching, is the word that created the world, right? So there's no need to insist on, uh, on the kind of specific difference, but there is an importance of centrality, and forgiveness is absolutely central, and in this way, in some ways, you can say he's unique, because forgiveness is fundamentally central uh, to him. Uh I guess there wouldn't be too many people that would say, you know, forgiveness is a bad thing, but most people struggle to do it. So at what points do you think there would be people who would say it's a bad thing? And well, there are people who, who say mm -hmm. that forgiveness is a, is a bad thing, especially depending on how you define forgiveness, right? Um, uh, if you define forgiveness, as I think forgiveness ought to be defined, uh, namely, something has wronged me and I don't count they're wronging me against them. That's forgiveness. Mm. Now, there are accounts of forgiveness, very popular, culturally, very widespread. And the, the, by culture, I mean ranging broadly from uh, Dr. Phil uh, on, on very popular shows to uh, philosophers, utilitarian philosophers, who think of forgiveness primarily in terms of dealing with my own, uh, one's own personal resentments. So forgiveness happens inside me. There's a rage uh, at the wrongdoing. I need to do something about it because it stifles me, obviously. It's the captivity, right, to the, to the, I need to get freed. And so it's all focused on myself, right? And that kind of makes a sense to people, right? But once you say, well, no, 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 this is not quite what forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't primarily a gift that I give to myself. 
Forgiveness is prim primarily a gift I give to somebody else. And then the question immediately is, of why on earth would you give this kind of gift to somebody else? They don't deserve that gift. It's not particularly rational for you to give that gift uh, to them. Uh, and then there are critics who think that if you give them a gift of forgiveness, they'll just abuse it. Um, they will tomorrow turn and devour somebody else as they have done to you, or they'll come back at you multiple times, right? You're going to be a doormat. And so th there are um, good reasons why people resist the idea of uh, forgiveness. And I think the response uh, to this is, uh, well, we need to make sure that we understand how forgiveness is to be done, but also to understand that the kind of calculus of um, what one deserves uh, and how one ought to be treated ought to be broken. That if we live by the calculus of moral deserts, uh, we live the below the level of our own, what's our best in our humanity. God has created us, I believe, in God's image. And God's image, God, is love and therefore forgiveness isn't something that, so to speak, goes against the grain of reality. It goes, it is in sync with the fundamental nature of the one who created everything and who is the sole source of all reality. And therefore we are as humans, I believe at our best, when we live in sync with God and therefore when we also forgive. If, if you were doing a coaching job with someone who was seeking or struggling with forgiveness, what would, what would you say? What, what do you think are the kind of starting points of, okay, these are the steps I need to take or these are the attitudes I need to uh, grasp. This is, this is the posture I need to take. The advice in terms of how to, mm. <laughs> I think it's always dependent on the particular situation of a person to whom you're giving an advice. And that's why I think something like a, uh, for forgiveness, something like almost spiritual direction is needed. And that's really specific to each one of us. But I think fundamental uh, to the character or to the motivation for forgiveness and to the process of forgiveness is a deep sense that I need to somehow align myself with God's character and behavior. And I say I need to align myself, and that seems like an imperative coming at me from outside. And yet it's also, I think, imperative that is inscribed in the very character of my human being. I do myself good when I do uh, things of this, of this sort. So a, a kind of a sense that I belong to a world in which forgiveness is a human way of living, a kind of sense to understand what I as a human being have received, uh, unconditionality of love uh, that I've received, I've received certainly from, from God in, in Jesus Christ, and then asking the question, well, how does that translate? What does that mean for me in this particular uh, situation? How can I, so to speak, give the gift of forgiveness that I've received, pass it on to somebody else? And indeed, I think that the return that we give to God, what does God need from us? Uh, need would be too strong in terms of anything, right? Um, I, I think in what, so you might ask the question, in what it is that God is delighted with regard to us? And my response would be God is delighted when the character of God <laughs> is replicated in our character, right? When we are truly ourselves as God has created us, there is a delight, our delight in God, God's delight in us, and the delight of creatures with whom we, whom we encounter. We've been discussing forgiveness at a very kind of personal individual le level. Does, does it work nationally? Is there, is there a kind of posture of forgive, forgiveness that can work across a nation? Um, I think we have to differentiate different levels of uh, forgiveness and different levels also of uh, reconciliation as a broader uh, term because I think that in, even in personal, interpersonal relationships, forgiveness is one moment 
in a larger story. And that larger story is a story of reconciliation, story of that which has been estranged coming together. In addition to uh, forgiveness, there needs to be some forms of repentance. There might ne need to be a form of trust building and so forth so that you have a, a forgiveness as an element of the reconciliation uh, process. Now, that has its own proper home, I believe, in interpersonal relationships. Uh, it's important for us to distinguish those interpersonal relationships of forgiveness and reconciliation from uh, communal or even political uh, relationships of reconciliation. Um, the, the reason is simply that when it comes to political forms of uh, expressions of forgiveness and reconciliation, you're dealing with multiple actors. You're dealing with rep idea of representation. Uh, a head of state uh, might ask for forgiveness, but is functioning as a representative of entire people. Now, entire people, they go each their own way. That's like herding cats, as we know, and it's a good that it is so, right? But that obviously presents issues and difficulties in terms of uh, forgiveness, just as it presents also in terms of national, say, repentance or apology or something of that, uh, of that sort. And so you need kind of cultures, you need to nurture cultures of forgiveness so that forgiveness, when the act happens, responsibly can be embraced by, by people and can, can move people forward. So I would say simply the, uh, this, there are analogs to forgiveness at a communal and at a national level, but strictly speaking, the home for, uh, of forgiveness are interpersonal relationships. In those interpersonal relationships, um, and I guess for your own experience, because you've had it modeled to you and been able to deal with that personally as a young man, um, has it always been easy? Do you, does it kind of come and go? Do you forgive yeah. and it's all done? Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, I think my experience is, uh, is very similar to experience of my mom. Uh, what she tells about forgiving the soldier who uh, was uh, caused um, my brother's uh, death, um, you decide to forgive and then um, you decide during the day in the middle of the night you wake up and then you don't forgive anymore. <laughs> <laughs> then you think, what have I done? Why on earth would I want to uh, forgive? And then you, you, you struggle and you forgive a, a, a little bit and then you take it back, you forgive a little bit more. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle. Mm. And it's a struggle uh, over what one knows one ought to do and is right also to do. And it stands also for kind of more general struggle to live a life of, we Christians say, of holiness, a life of um, kind of imaging the character uh, of God. Uh, and that struggle is there and, and continues. And my sense is also, it's very important to emphasize, I think, uh, we, we <laughs> we also never quite know what we're doing when we're forgiving and never can quite fully forgive. And that's okay. Um, the reason I say that we never quite know what we're doing when we're forgiving, I have my own story about what somebody did to me when they wronged me. It's not always clear to me that my story is the right story. <laughs> And it's not just not clear to me because the other piece, people, my, person might not see it that way, but because I know how in many, many situations, if I'm a little bit self-reflective, how I distort things. Sometimes if I'm good to myself in my favor and sometimes if I'm down on myself uh, to my detriment, right? This kind of idea of, uh, of that I know what it is that I'm forgiving, is, it's a very rough thing, right? And I have to live with this roughness of forgiveness. And the other person, too, has to live with the roughness of forgiveness, right? Part of the difficulty of forgiveness is that somebody who, whom I forgive, they don't think there's something to forgive, or they don't think that that which I'm forgiving is there to be forgiven, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to adjust this. And if you want too perfect of a forgiveness, you won't have, no forg you won't have any forgiveness. So we live always with this imperfect forgiveness. Um, 
and we live, even when we strive to do it really right and well, and we live, I think, in view of the forgiveness that God offered to all of us. In some ways, I believe that all forgiveness is an echo, sometimes muted, sometimes garbled, uh, but nonetheless an echo of God's forgiveness to us. And I hope that one day it's going to flower fully into the full forgiveness and uh, uh, the, the overarching, encompassing forgiveness that will be true and uh, in, in, in the full sense of the term. Probably the, one of the hardest people to forgive is yourself, though, isn't it? In that whole process, because that's, a, that's still forgiveness, but it's that, and, and you're pretty clear often what you've got wrong. Is, is, it, is it the same process when you're dealing, as it were, with your own reflections on your own life? Yeah, no, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's tougher to do it to forgive it, uh, yourself. I'm not sure that we are often, that, that we know what we need to forgive ourselves. Um, I think we are opaque <laughs> to ourselves often. Um, and I think for, for me, the central uh, verse was uh, the one from 1 John, that God is greater than our hearts. And I think in, in, the, in a very significant sense that this has to be taken, greater in a sense that God is more generous sometimes to ourselves than we are, but greater in a sense that our hearts are not just deceitful, but we don't know what's in there. <laughs> they hide what's, what's inside. And uh, therefore, uh, only slowly do we come to know what actually happened, what transpired, what am I to blame myself for, what not. Um, and I think in this entire process of both identifying my own guilt or my own failure for which I cannot forgive myself and living with it, uh, a sense that God is greater than my knowledge of it, God is greater than my, that my, the claim of that uh, upon me, God is greater and his unconditional love forgives. That's where I at least find freedom. You were talking earlier about aligning our lives with God. Is there, is there a process of the closer that you align yourself with the things of God, that the clearer some of the things that you need to deal with are? I, I think there is, the, I think there, there certainly is some, some of that. I think um, we need to be, when it comes to our lives, when it comes to entire trajectory of our lives, but when it comes also to personal uh, aspect, individual aspects of our lives, uh, we need to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Uh, we need to have eyes to see what is right for us. And the more we are aligned with divine purposes, the more, I think, openness we have to see uh, correctly. More, I think, also, or, or I put it the other way, the less I think we think is at stake that we actually get it right, <laughs> uh, less firmly do we want to hold onto ourselves because we realize that we are actually held. And that gives us opportunity to actually see ourselves more truly if we don't clutch and hold ourselves too tightly. Let just explore the, the, how you understand Jesus' forgiveness. Because for many people, at a really basic level, the idea of Jesus dying on a cross is just a bizarre concept. So for you, what, how do you explain that in the light of forgiveness? Well, I think that forgiveness, uh, uh, in the most fundamental sense, uh, God's forgiveness of humanity, uh, happened on the cross. And I read the cross, understand the cross, as so, so maybe best analog, uh, analog to what happens on the, on the cross is actually, I think, what happens in baptism. The uh, way Apostle Paul describes baptism is, uh, I have died with Christ and raised with Christ, right? This is Romans uh, 6. Kind of sense of a self that dies and is raised and becomes a new self. I think something analogous or foundation for what happens in baptism is what happens uh, on the cross. So that 
in Christ, it is not that Christ dies instead of us. Certainly not that Christ dies to somehow satisfy wrath of God, because I think Christ is God, and therefore there is no wrath to be uh, satisfied, because the cross is the expression of radicality of God's love. But then it's not so much that Christ dies instead of us, but more fundamentally is that in Christ we die. So the key for me, in my understanding of the cross, is one died for all, which is what Apostle Paul says, and then the consequence is not, therefore, none of us has to die. Actually, he says, therefore, all have died, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the idea of inclusive substitution. So that in a mysterious way, we are in Christ. We undergo death and resurrection. And so that the salvation and the forgiveness happens precisely through the process of dying and raising, raising again. And in that sense, I think that actually the only one who can forgive truly is God. And that's why I think that all of our forgiveness isn't kind of independently imitating what God has done for us, but rather echoing it, uh, rather affirming it for ourselves, but already has been done on the cross in regard to others, in regard to ourselves as well. So Miroslav, at some point in your life, you had to decide that you would align, as it were, with God in your life. How did you make that choice personally? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> uh, I think... Um, I think I was always attracted to Christian faith because I lived in an environment of uh, faith that was authentically lived. And that was obviously attractive, but in some ways I felt that uh, as a 15 year old kid, that I was given too much. I was, it's almost like a burden that I didn't know how to bear. Uh, I didn't know how to feel the, ha, ha, that this, in a sense, the attractiveness of it was, uh, was also what was repelling. Uh, obviously, there are other things that were attracting me at the same, at the same time. And um, I think in a strange way, I um, traveled with a group of uh, Swedish kids uh, and in interactions with them. Um, and up in Sweden somewhere as a 16-year-old, uh, I have somehow made some decision that I didn't know when I have made and that nonetheless somehow um, had impact upon my life. I think I would uh, almost describe it, it's not that I've done something, but I have been done too. <laughs> uh, God has found me rather than I have found God. Because it wasn't an easy place, was it? Because I know... Um the, when you went to school at that period of time and deciding wow. to stand out as a follower of Jesus was not exactly popular. Well, not even follower of Jesus. The, the, to, to stand out as a, as a person who was, uh, I was the only openly professing kid once I, once I did it, but also standing out as a son of a Pentecostal minister. It was just crazy. Nobody knew what Pentecostal is. And, you know, so it's everybody was uh, laughing at you. And I swore to God, I'll never do to my kids what my dad did to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and no, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't terribly, terribly easy. But then in, in some ways it became my form of rebellion, right? Against what it was there, right? I was rebelling for a while against my parents and then I started rebelling against the system. That, that works. <laughs> yeah, good on you. This series is called Jesus the Game Changer. For you, how is Jesus the Game Changer? You know, I think the most fundamental uh, to me personally uh, about, and, and to me also as a theologian, um, about Jesus is that he brought the practice of and the message of the unconditional love of God. He was God's face turned toward us in radical uh, embrace. I, I think that changes just about everything. It changes the entire way in which we think about ourselves and the way in which we think about uh, the world. Uh, think of it this way. I think of it sometimes very personally this way. We live in an environment in which I have to prove myself from the moment I wake up 
and look at myself in the mirror, I'm already branding myself for somebody who is going to see me, judge me. I have to sell myself all the time. This is the life that we, that we lead, right? And somebody comes and tells you, you're unconditionally loved. It's extraordinary message that kind of transforms individual, I think, but transforms also the entire environment in which we find ourselves, transforms also entire cultures. And I believe that um, in my, my senses, that is at the very heart of the Christian message, at the very heart of the message of forgiveness, message of care. Uh, and it's at the very heart of the way in which we are meant to live as human beings.